Hello to our Elevation family, all our INC family. A big welcome to anyone who's joining us online for the very first time today. My name is Brad and I get the great privilege of being on team here at Elevation. And thank you again for joining us for what I think is gonna be a absolutely incredible service. In a moment's time, Locke and the team are gonna lead us through some worship and then we're gonna hear from our lead pastor on standing firm. And let, let me, I have no doubt that the message that Pastor Ross brings is going to be an encouragement for all of us out there today. Before we do that, before we get into our service, can I say thank you for your generosity over this season for enabling us to still be the hands and feet to our communities. And so we want to say a big thank you for that. All the details of giving are on the screen right now, they're at the, below the screen right here, or they're in our chat. Press on that and we again, we thank you for your generosity. Well, Enjoy the service, Locke's gonna take it away. And then as I said, get ready because Pastor Ross brings an incredible message on standing firm. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. Believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still, the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Come together sons and daughters with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Our God will finish what He started This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story Testimony 
cover me I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout The universe display Then sings my Then sings my soul shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall then I shall Thank you.
Well, welcome to Elevation Church. Uh, it's so great to be with you today. And I am in my first live setting sharing the Word of God in six months. So uh, we got a little bit of noise coming from uh, our space today to your space and really trust in no matter what situation you find yourself in that God's doing something amazing in you and through you. I know a lot of our locations are either meeting in, uh, in the flesh or currently planning on meeting. And I know also for our family in Melbourne, uh, the jury is still out. So we're praying for each and every one of us so that God would give us wisdom on when is the best time to start re-engaging on our weekend services. But today I get the honor to share the word of God with all of us. I also want to give a little plug for our Basaw Ranch Quick Fit that's coming up in the month of October. Uh, there'll be a contact email on the screen right now that if you are a tradie or you want to, you're, you're a person that you can just carry heavy things or you can, you know, you can look beautiful and you want to stand on a ranch and wear a cowboy hat, then the quick fit for the whole month of October, uh, we're renovating other parts of the property and honestly bring the fam and hang out there and do some work and enjoy the 430 acres. It will be absolutely amazing. So uh, contact us and that would be fantastic. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. The Apostle Paul is writing, and to give you a little bit of context, he's in prison, but every day he is guarded by a Roman centurion or a Roman guard that Paul would be watching uh, dress himself. So the Romans, the soldiers dress themselves in a lot of armory and, and shoes and belts and different aspects. And so when Paul wrote this, he was actually in sight of a Roman soldier fully dressed in what we're about to read here. Verse 10, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rule, evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And after the battle, you will still be standing firm. You know, right now, vigilance is what God requires of us, his followers. And probably unlike any other time in history, certainly in my generation, I think we all share this weight of just being aware at the moment, aware of, of a society that is shifting so fast, a, an economy that's moving and, and leaves us feeling quite vulnerable. And as the followers of Christ, as his church, to be vigilant and not be one of these people who begins to, to uh, uh, you know, almost shoot across the trenches at one another, but we understand that there are, are spiritual forces at work here behind the scenes. And I don't know about you, but I often find when I'm in my season of, of tension or pressure or conflict, it's easy to look at, at our spouse or our kids or our work environment as that's the issue. And we negate the fact that Paul said here, hey, dress yourself in armor because there are spiritual forces at work that, that want to unfoot you, that want to make you feel vulnerable. You know, for Kathy and I, 33 years in leadership in a church context and stand firm has been our go to. Uh, many years ago, when people told us that our marriage was over, uh, that, that was their words that to give up on it. Uh, I'm glad we stood firm. Uh, we've had many a sleepless night as we've prayed for our children, child in particular. And uh, I'm so glad that my go to and Kathy's go to has been stand firm. I'm so glad that when we were youth pastors in a church many years ago, we had five senior pastors come through. It was like a bus station as they all transitioned through. I'm so glad that we could be an example to our young people just to stand firm. Don't get swayed by the toing and going. I'm so glad that stand firm uh, was our go-to in some financial pressure. I'm so glad that stand firm was our go-to when we were surrounded in confusion and murmuring. James said this in chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. 
And we don't want to be those people that are just swayed. You know, we hear so many conspiracies at the moment and we sway this way, we sway that way. So many thoughts and so many, you know, you watch the media and everyone says that this is going to happen. And then the next day, it's that's going to happen. And, and state premiers are, are swayed and elections coming up and we get moved so often. But James says, we don't want to be that person that's like a piece of driftwood on the sea of humanity, just getting blown wherever the wind wants to take us. We've got to stand firm. You know, it would not be a message from me without a, a one horse illustration. And um, this is my new go-to. It used to be bicycles, now it's horses. And, um, but, but this is true. Every day, a horse wakes up and wants to work out how he can work his way up the pecking order. Every single day. And unfortunately, my discovery is that I'm part of that pecking order. And so if you think about this, every day on his mind is, how can I move up one notch? That's all I want to do. I just want to move up. I don't want to be the bottom of the barrel anymore. I just want to move up one notch. And so when a horse comes in and, you know, maybe nuzzles you a little bit, people often go, oh, it's so beautiful. He's, you know, look how cute he is. But you know what he's really doing? He's actually saying, I just want to get close enough and move you away because that tells me I've got dominance over you. Uh, uh, you know, you, you learn that a horse, uh, as my horse, uh, w- when he first came to me, he, he knew no social boundaries. And so he was a close talker, like he would come right up. And so I've had to learn how to back him up because, hey, this is my space, not your space. But when you understand the thinking of a horse, you realize he's actually, this is his way to try and make sure that he's above me and I'm below him. In his mind, the pecking order. Now, here's the, th- here's the thing. Every day, Something or someone wants to move your feet and get above you in the pecking order. And the only way to stop a horse to, from doing what he's doing is you have tools like this. This is a flag, a very dirty flag. Uh, you can use a rope, but you learn to move a horse's feet. So the noise and the movement of this flag actually startles the horse a little bit and gets him some respect in his world to understand, hey, I'm not mucking around. You move your feet, I'm not moving my feet. And every day, something in your world, every day, wants to move your feet. It it wants to tell you what you're not. It wants to push you to the side. It wants to try and dominate something in your life. It could be fear, fear of the future, anxiety. Intimidation is a big one. Intimidating circumstances and people try to move your feet. Maybe there's that person at work that tries to to dominate and they say things that are demeaning to you. What they're doing, horse analogy, they're trying to move your feet. They're trying to make sure in the pecking order that they have got one over you. Maybe it's loneliness, depression, unmet expectations, criticism, uh, discontentment, doubt, negativity. Every day, every single day, something is trying to move your feet. I want to read to you from the book of Mark, chapter 4. A very familiar story, verse 35 to 38, says this, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Great idea. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I love the way the Bible adds that little, you know, descriptive part of Jesus' head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Isn't it amazing that the first words of the disciples were these words of what they believed Jesus was not going to do for them. That you never hear most of us talk about, uh, uh, you know, we never question God's love for us when the weather's fine. It's normally when the weather turns bad and something is going wrong. And an anxious and fearful response is how we show up when we're not getting what we think we need in any given moment. It's how we react to the internal or external pressure to do something or when we feel triggered or exposed. And that's exactly what the disciples felt at that moment. And you'll notice their language, don't you care that we're going to drown? You know, one of the signs of unhealthy thinking is what they call catastrophizing. 
And many of you can relate to this, is that it's something small happens, but you have the ability to blow it out of proportion. And you look through Scripture, Elijah did it, Jonah did it. I mean, Jonah, through the grace of God, God grew him a plant to sit under, but even then he complained about the plant. I'm going to die out here, it's, it's too hot. Moses did it, the apostle Peter did it. There's this ability to, to, to see something small that's gone wrong in your life and blow it out of proportion. It's the, you know, when you're, when you're parenting and you've got a small child that rebels eating veggies and you think to yourself, well, that rebellion, I've got to get the rebellion out. Otherwise, when he's 15, he's going to rebel against high school and he's never going to get work and he's going to be homeless and he's going to steal the rest of his life. He's going to end up in prison. He's probably, and all because he won't eat his vegetables. And, and so we had this ability to, to blow out a proportion. And the disciples' first response is, hey, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? Proverbs 15, verse 15 says this, For the despondent every day brings trouble, but for the happy heart, life is a continual feast. So for the person who always expects the worst, every day, every day, trouble just comes. And I know a lot of you can relate to that right now in this COVID season that, that, you know, surrounded by so much negativity about your business prospects, about your health, about your superannuation, all, all these things that are going on right now. It's easy to feel like the day of the despondent. But the truth is storms will do that to you. They disorientate us. They discourage us. They drain our strength as we try and row into a headwind. But the worst storms I've come to discover aren't the ones that are on the outside of the boat. They're the ones that get on the inside of the boat. And for the disciples, everything was fine until the Bible says the water and the waves began to break break over the boat and into the boat. And that's when their alarm bells went off. And I believe one of the reasons why we struggle to grow deeper in a relationship with Christ is because we are so unaware of anxiety's grip. Fear and anxiety competes for the space in which God resides. It blocks our awareness of God and shrinks our capacity to be fully present with one another. The psalmist in Psalm 94 verse 19 said it like this, when I was, uh, And when I was burdened with worries, you comforted me and made me feel secure. But one of the big things when the waves are breaking over the boat and water's getting on the inside of the boat is that that fear of the future fills the void where God wants to rest and where God wants to sit in our life. And so our mind begins to race on how we can fix these problems. The same chronic problem is faced by so many people around the world, and it's this. We think God is only with us, not also ahead of us. And so we think we're bringing God into a situation rather than remembering that God is already ahead of us in the situation. Fear and anxiety shrinks the power of the gospel because it presents a false gospel, one of self-reliance rather than reliance on Christ. And anxiety is a sign that this false self is demanding. We nourish it instead of dying to it. So we tirelessly work and worry about fighting for control. And yet a couple of verses I want to pull out as we look through the Bible, and these would be again familiar, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Now understand the context of this was written about the Jewish people in captivity in Babylon. It was a 70 year promise that that, that it took 70 years to come to pass. Uh, But still, through what Christ has done for us, this is still applicable to you and I. It says this, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, through what Jesus did upon the cross for you and I, that future and that hope is as real for you and I today. And for us to understand, you know, this Jeremiah 29, as a, when I was a young follower of Christ, when I first, uh, you know, really ever committed my life to Christ, this was, I wrote it and I had an old living Bible, a green hardcover living Bible that I wrote every prophetic word I ever got and every scripture that ever spoke to me. 
This was the central one. For a young guy that came from a very insecure upbringing, uh, non-Christian background, to have a, a, a verse where my heavenly father declares good and plans for, for purpose and intention over me. Let me tell you, for, for, for someone that didn't have a healthy relationship with his father, that was priceless and still is for me today. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 and again Paul speaking and this is another of my go-tos and I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ so again it's that confidence God you're not only in my present you're not only working on me now but you're waiting for me in my future that, that this isn't something that, that every day I've got to hope and pray you into my future. When I get there, you're already there. You're waiting for me. And I don't want to allow the fear and anxiety of what is happening in the world to move my feet. I want to be a person that can stand firm. I want to show generations to come. You know what? I may not be the prettiest or the smartest, but I know how to stand. I know how to endure hardship. I know as a, a, like a good soldier, I, I know how to be someone that sees that this is about longevity. It's about a marathon, not just a sprint. And I think Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 reminds me that God is not the typical Australian male who starts a renovation and stops halfway through. Okay, God isn't the sort of person that has all this blue tarpaulin over his bathroom because he just can't be bothered. He doesn't have the old Holden on Besser blocks in the front yard because he started to pimp my ride and then pulled out halfway through. Jesus, look at the cross. He is a completer. He is a finisher. He doesn't start something in our life and then just pull away saying, oh man, you're too much hard work. He is committed to us to finish what he started. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 27, and then verse 33. Uh, Jesus talking, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, I, I, I get anxious over what I, you know, one of my, I think the word, I, the statement I ask Kathy more than anything else is, what's for dinner? I mean, I, I, I love, I don't know about anyone else, but I love knowing what's coming for dinner. Anyway, that's a bit odd. Um, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life, it is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I love this verse here. Some of us need to hear this today. Are you not of more value than they? Just let that sink in for a moment. Because, you know, we, we rush on. But Jesus is saying, we're anxious over a whole bunch of stuff and how the future is going to look and what about this and job keeper finishing and how would this thing work? And Jesus says, are you not of more value than everything else that I take care of? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Thomas, uh, Thomas Akempis, 14th century clergyman, said this, the more a man dies to himself, the more he begins to live unto God. You know, the consistent witness of the New Testament is that freedom and life come when we deny crucify and are wary of the unhealthy something on the inside of us that shrinks the gospel. Back to the story as we come to a close, Mark 4, verse 39. Jesus in the boat, verse 39. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind. I actually wonder, I wonder whether he was asleep or whether he just had his eyes closed, you know, <laughs> listening to the commotion around him, thinking to himself, boys, 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 it's going to be okay. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you so afraid? Now, can I, you know, as we read this, why are you so afraid? Sometimes we read scripture like God's got an angry face on. You know, like, like maybe your dad or your mum are saying, why did you kick the soccer ball through the window? It's not Jesus looking at them with this angry face saying, why are you afraid? Because that's sometimes our perception of the way God views us. But picture Jesus with this loving, maybe naughty look on his face, like he knew why they're afraid, but he's just kind of having fun with them. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And again, when we read that, we kind of take it from a negative connotation as if Jesus is highlighting what they don't have. That's what it wasn't about. 
Jesus is, is trying to stir in them again to say, hey, guys, understand we're in this journey together. I'm in your future and I'm in your current right now. You don't need to be afraid. I am with you every step of the way. I have promised you this. So why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? <laughs> Sounds like a line from a Clint Eastwood movie. Do -do 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 -do. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. This is what I love. It was out of that centered, restful, God-aware inner world of Christ that he spoke to the storm. It wasn't in this hurried, uh, fearful, anxious place. Because here's the deal. You can't speak peace and silence to external turmoil when you're full of internal turmoil. I've tried to fake it. I've tried to, to, you know, I've been on missions trips and doesn't even have to be a missions trip where you're praying for people who are missing a limb or are blind and, you know, you're trying to cover over the unbelief you have in your own life as you lay hands on them. And it's almost like a, a sympathy prayer. Please, God, do something for their benefit, you know, because I've, I've got nothing to give. And Jesus, from the restful place of confidence in his God, says, everything's going to be okay. Silence. Be still. Frederick Dale Bruner, in his commentary on the book of John, redefines trusting in Jesus as rela relaxing in Jesus. He writes, relaxing in is a good modern translation of trusting in or believing in. In fact, he says, it is the goal of the entire gospel of John to create this relaxation. You know, maybe... Our greatest work is to learn how to relax in Jesus. Easier said than done. And it means every day you and I have to wake up, and not just once, multiple times during the day when your kids come home with something bad that's happened at school, when you open up that email or that mail that you get and you weren't expecting that news, when the phone call comes or something goes wrong, every day we've got to say, God, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to relax in you. And I'm not going to move my feet. I'm not going to walk away from what has got me 33 years in because of the storm that's blowing around me right now, because a few waves are crashing over the hull and getting into the inside of my heart. I want to stay firm. I want to stand firm. Jesus moves the feet of the storm. He says, silence. It's all going to be okay. And I want to ask you today, what is it right now in your world where you feel like something or someone is trying to move your feet? And maybe some of the promises that you've held on to, maybe that prophetic word, maybe some of those verses, maybe some of the connections that you've had that you've held on to that feel really vulnerable and loose at the moment and, and you're not quite sure what, what's all this going to look like. And, and even in your own faith, you're feeling a little bit shaken. Can I encourage you today that, you know, as you stand firm, you may not have all the answers. None of us do. We don't know what the future is going to look like. But won't it be an enjoyable journey if we can discover it together? Yeah. And so our goal, my goal is, and I believe it's the, the, the thrust of this story, and is why Scripture shows Jesus asleep on a pillow, because he's trying to role model, you know what, when, when you know that I've got you, when I'm not just in your present, but I'm also waiting for you in your future, you don't have to be so filled with anxiety and fear about what may go wrong or what may go right. You don't have to slip into the self-reliance of trying to control the, the, the atmosphere and the environment and the future to try and get the desired outcome. I have got this. So don't let the circumstances of what you're feeling move your feet. Have an unshakable hope. Try not to put our, circum our, our hope in circumstances or only in people, but let's adjust our sail and say, God, help me to relax in Christ today. When we anchor ourselves in Jesus, when we drop our anchor in what Jesus did upon the cross for you and I, it's amazing how the ocean around us begins to quieten and our feet aren't moved. So stand firm. Jesus is working in our present, but he's also waiting for you in your future. And you know, today, maybe you're, you're like one of the disciples. I see myself in those disciples when I, as I read through scripture, man, I, I just repeatedly, 
And I wish I could say I see myself more as Jesus, but I see myself more as one of the disciples. And that's why I want to encourage you. Every day, these are decisions. It's not a one-time, one-time decision that you never have to make again in your life. Every day, I'm going to make a decision. Father, help me to relax in you because of everything that's around. And, and more than once, you know, several times during a day to make that decision. But you know what? Today, you and I have an opportunity to make a decision, and maybe it's the first time you've ever made this decision, to actually surrender your life, your present and your future to Jesus. Maybe you don't realize that he wants to invade your space right now. And maybe you don't realize that he wants to be a part of your future. Let me tell you, it is the most freeing, uh, uh, relaxing thought, knowing that God is waiting for me in my future as well as being in my current present season right now. And so what I want to do is I simply want to pray. I want us to pray together. This is not a magical prayer. It's not mystical. It's not magical words. It's simply a, a surrender prayer. It, it, it's, it's a beginning prayer that says, hey, Jesus, I think I need you. I, I need this, the creator of the universe to come into my world right now. I am feeling swamped. I am feeling overwhelmed with the anxiety and the fear of what is around me. I need someone that can help me to stand firm. And so together, if that's you and you say, you know what, Ross, I, I want to pray that prayer. Or maybe you had prayed it somewhere in your life, but you know that you are so far from God. But the great news is one decision away. That's how close you are. Just one tweak of your heart back towards Christ. That's all he wants from us. He's not after big steps today. It all starts with little steps. And so I want to pray. And if you want to join me in this prayer, that would be fantastic. Let's pray together. Father, today, I thank you that you love me, you gave your life for me. Jesus, I thank you that what you've started in my life, you are committed to finish. So right now, I surrender my life, my fear, my anxiety, my worry, the, the need to control my life. I courageously give it to you. And I pray today that you would step into my boat, my situation right now. And Father, give me the confidence that your word is true, that you'll never leave me, you'll never forsake me. And I thank you for it today. In your wonderful name, amen. You know, Pastor Ross just prayed a prayer. Uh, and maybe you said that prayer for the very first time today. And I want to congratulate you on what I think is the best decision that you could ever make. All of heaven right now is rejoicing at that decision that you made. And the reality is we want to, we want to celebrate with you too. And so we would love nothing more than to hear about the, the, that you've made that decision so we can help you on this journey. And so if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, uh, that, that in, the, in the chat button right now is a little tab that says, I commit my life to Christ. You can essentially just press that button. That'll take you to through to one of our team members and they will start a conversation with you. And we would love to do this journey with you. Alternatively, you can, you can press the live prayer button right now that's in our on our online screen. And again, one of our team members would love to pray with you would love to talk to you about this decision that you've just made well that's it from us today we trust you enjoyed your service with us pray you have a great week this week and we look forward to seeing you online again next sunday